All right, everyone. Welcome back. We're getting into chapter four. It's heating up. It's heating up in here. Is it just? It's probably the lights. Probably the lights. Uh, I forgot. We need to. We've got two things we have to do in today's lesson. Today's listening lesson. Uh, one of those is the word of the week to use. Okay, depending on when you listen to this. So there's going to be two words. All right. The first one from last week, which I forgot to mention, is going to be jaunty. Jaunty, right? You got you just got to work that in to your sentences this week, which bring back some of that old English. The beginning of this chapter, chapter four, right? Chapter four is better take that off. <laughs> chapter four is called the Whirly Gig of Armistice. Whirly Gig. What the hell is that? What is a Whirly Gig? I'm, before I even get into, it, I'm just I'm just gonna look at that whirl. Uh, and whilst I'm doing this, leave me a comment or a question in the window. Make sure you check out the websites for all the cool stuff. Whirly gig meaning, right? This is a, I thought this was like a made up word. All right. Yeah. Any, any various spinning toys. Great. A carousel or mer merry-go-round. Okay. But again, we just, this is a better word. Carousel, boring. Whirly gig, baby. All right. This is cool. So come with me now. Make sure you're a channel member. Or you go to boringmastery.tv forward slash access to check out the way I can help you to become the best boring dancer you can and to help your trots align. All right. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, check out the previous chapter. Okay. So curiously enough, with the rage of war comes the rage for dancing. Now that's interesting. Why is that, do you reckon? People do let go a lot more. Why? You're probably going to die tomorrow. That's a real thing. Yeah, we're in peacetime at the moment, so we can't relate. This was a long time ago, over 100 years, but it does do that to people, right? From accounts I've read, the war of 1914 to 1918 was no exception since World War I. And with the advent of armistice, this rage grew in intensity. It roared, metaphorically and literally. Now, we all heard of the Roaring Twenties, haven't we? This is where it's coming out. The band themselves were a riot. They blasted their music out, drowning all conversation. Oh, the Height of, the height of these people. Polite society? I think not. Look at these guys. Drummers had no inhibitions whatsoever, encircled by paraphernalia of odds and ends resembling tin kettles or any conceivable nonsense, which at a touch would produce sounds similar to our sirens of the present day. And they beat out the rhythm. Yeah, nice. These guys are like leading pioneers, okay? Now we just sample things, unfortunately, but these are the real artists, man. They're getting in there. I love it. I can feel the energy. By this time, our walk and trot had developed into what is known as the jazz roll. All right. I don't know what that is. <laughs> this was a figure of one walk and two trots timed as slow, quick, quick. Uh, that must be the feather. Close to, I think, anyway. But I know there's a difference in that for sure. But the trot had now disappeared and a long gliding movement had taken its place. There we go. It's developing. It's coming in. I do remember, actually, it may not be measured in this, but the feather, right? I remember Anthony Hurley telling me in a lesson that uh, the feather was designed because it, it wasn't danced in a straight line. The fox shot curves, yes? Like the reverse wave, it should curve. And the feather was designed, called a feather step because like the shape of a quill, it should actually curve a little bit. So you have a curved feather, which is you know quite a strong curve, and then the actual feather step still has a, a gentle curve to it. Right. So I think this is sort of how it all developed. It was executed. Oh, here we go. It was executed in continuous curves and had the motion of a boat on a rough sea. So the dancers, to keep their equilibrium, adopted the style of a man pressing his head firmly on the lady's perm. <laughs> and with this posture, he went the fashion of the man raising his partner's right arm and his and his own left in one, I, I don't know if I can read this next line. Here we go. But I'm going to go there, but please, YouTube, don't ban me. I'm historical reference here. So let me just recap this bit before we get into it. With this posture, with the fashion of the man raising his partner's right arm above his own and his left in one white, in, with the, I don't know if I can say this. I don't want to say this, right? Maybe we can just because this is hilarious. Uh, as a as the fact that she wrote this, one might term a Heil Hitler sign above their heads. Yep, there they are. They're going through it. But I mean, he didn't come to power at this point, did he? You know. So there we go. But that's a very weird reference to make. You imagine me in a studio right now. It's like, hey everyone, this is what we're doing right now. Just the Sig Heil. 
time to do a, a jazz roll. Are you ready? Just no one's left in my class. So the jazz roll was not a beautiful innovation, but it had its value as it was the first introduction of the long gliding movement, which was to take which was to make the English mode of dancing so famous through the world. That's true. So the long, for those who aren't familiar, the foxtrot is a difficult dance. And part of the reason is because, yeah, we're fancily walking, but the long gliding movements, all right, that's what make it beautiful, but also very tricky to master. We careered happily through this distorted period, but later sophistication came in. I do like the dark humor in this. Like there is, you know, like she's a bit cheeky, isn't she? Right, the way, way she's writing there, like, you know, Talking about the Heil Hitler sign, about that related to ballroom dancing, her like shoulder, you know, showing her shoulder, things like that, being a rebel, not going to school because of the boots that she wanted to wear. Like, we're getting a good picture of her. She is a disruptor. She's like a ballroom dancing entrepreneur, original OG, right? Like, she's, she's actually paving the way. Very, very cool. I, I wonder if she gets to mention a bit later on about any backlash she may have had because people didn't do this back then. You know, you didn't, you didn't step out of your lane, so to speak, right? So Murray's Club in Big Street was the meeting ground for the smart set of London. Every afternoon at tea time, financiers and big businessmen of all types were to be seen dancing with their women friends. That's so classy. Awesome. What attracted everyone to this club was the rhythmical and quiet music of a colored band called the Versatile Four. Well, at least she's politically correct, I suppose. The jazz roll had smoothed itself out. And uh, had now the appearance of a flowing stream of movement, sometimes merging into a more restful one of walks and chassés. The hold had become more normal. So I'd say the hold is in the ballroom hold, right? Improvis improvisation was rife. Rife, I tell you. A turn used in our dance today, known as the open turn, was originated as far back as the period as I'm writing by one of these city magnates. It was called after him the Morgan turn. Right, yeah, this this guy was a boss. He had a step named after him. I can remember that dancing was uh, that dancing as clear as it, clearly as if it was yesterday. I will venture to say that it compares favorably with the dancing seen in our clubs and restaurants. Um, is anyone dancing <laughs> at a restaurant? Nope, nope. No. People are on their phones. Unfortunately, Josephine, people have lost all type of conversation skills and really suck at interpersonal networking. So nobody's dancing up in these clubs anymore, right? They have to go to special places for that. So perhaps it was the performers that gave it its pleasant aspect. To my mind, the well-bred men of that period are hard to beat. There you go, gentlemen. You've got to be well-bred, apparently, to, yep, to be unbeatable. One wonders... Whether and by the way, that is a saying as well as uh, you know a, an actual meaning. So one with, wonders whether it may not have been that these men, having just passed through a tremendous experience, I'm assuming the war, and been so often under the shadow of death, were thus rendered more appreciative of the good things of life, more sensitive to their values. Oh, you're damn right. Uh, what's the saying? Hard times create hard men, and you know, soft times create soft men. But like, if you came back from that war, not only would you have like PTSD, but you'd need an outlet. Could you imagine being able to go to a venue, drink, there's music, you can dance around, you're getting attention from like women. What else would there be to take your mind off things really back then besides maybe drinking too much and just reminiscing all the time? It was, uh, yeah. So what an awesome thing to at least be able to do after fighting for your country like that. That's amazing. Even in their dancing, they did not shuffle around carelessly. They took the trouble, most of them, to learn. But on the other hand, there seemed to be many men in those days who had a natural instinct to dance well. Gentlemen, there are, I, I just had a guy like this on the weekend. In his mind, he would never in a, ever in a million years step into a dance studio. But his daughter was getting married. He figured, I want to have a dance lesson. He was so coordinated. I tried to say, you could actually dance if you wanted to, for real. Just like, come and have a dance, learn to dance. But he was so insecure about himself as a man dancing. But he was so good. And I've had people who really want to dance, who, God bless, couldn't close their feet, man. Like, they couldn't to, to have balance to save their life. Not at all. So it's really fascinating. And a lot of men are much better than they, than they can understand. Um, but, you know, society conditions it otherwise for men. So... Now, in those days who had a natural instinct to dance well, also they dressed well. See, that helps. 
I think Taylor's must have been better then. For instance, the craze for over padded shoulders was rather looked upon with distaste, and shoes were men's pride. I had a friend who possessed a collection of footwear and paraded them in front of you as if you were presenting a row of precious stones, rolling off his tongue the names of all the famous shoemakers in the tone of voice one might use in speaking of great artists. That's, that's amazing. Do you have a shoe collection such as this, gentlemen? Times have changed. One thing that has not changed, gentlemen, get a good suit made for you. I'm telling you, have suits made for you or have a jacket made for you. Um, or buy a jacket and then get it shaped for you, it makes a big difference. Shirts from Sulkers, dress shirts, and waistcoats from Hawes and Curtis were not considered luxury but a necessity, though probably half of the men could not afford them. But it was regarded as somewhat plebeian to pay your shirt maker or tailor or anyhow to pretend you did. Okay, it's plebeian, sorry, plebeian. Yeah, I haven't used that. That's maybe a third word we whack in there. We just call people plebs now <laughs> so as more of a, uh, a way to, to, to denote people of social rank, right, and to mock them. Rather an amusing kind of snobbery, except for the tailor and shirt maker, they no doubt made up for this tidiness in payment by putting our on interest against the Day of Atonement. Okay, I need to think about that. But I do like the idea of everyone having to dress well and get nice things made. The women, however, of that post-war period in appearance cannot be said to compare well with the women of today. The fashions were very unflattering, hairdressing was not pretty, and cosmetics were not so good as they are now. It was a pity because the beauties of that date, as well as the uh, the plentiful, sorry, the beauties of that date, as plentiful as blackberries, were, I think, more charming than the beauties of today. Yeah, people are going a bit crazy though. Like fashion today is like pretty shit. It's just terrible. Most people have no idea how to put clothes together, particularly women. Like, wear dresses, ladies. Like, dresses are fantastic. You can wear short ones, long ones, but they're sexy, you know? They, they can also be, like, nice. They don't always have to be, like, suggestive, but it makes a big difference, you know, um, to wearing good clothes. And, you know, baggy-ass jeans and sneakers is not really trendy. Like, it's, I mean, it is a trend, but it doesn't look good. I feel like an old man waffling on right now, but i got to say, I think fashion is timeless. There are certain things that work well for men, and certain things that work well for women, and uh, that's not really going to change unless the body shapes change too much. Now, they were not synthetic. To mention a few on stage alone, there were Gladys Cooper, Phyllis and Zena Dare, Gladys Dillis, Gabrielle Ray, Gentry Miller and Gertrude Lawrence. Wow, this is some mouthfuls of names right there. So the most exclusive place to dine was the Embassy Club in Bond Street, of which Luigi was the leading light and proprietor. Yeah, he has the name of a proprietor. That's an awesome one. Everybody knows Luigi. Go to Luigi's, have a dance. He knew society thoroughly. There we go. With its different tastes and foibles, his cuisine was impeccable. And Peter, the maitre, maitre d' of the hotel, was it? as important in his sphere as the Bishop of London in his diocese. There you go. He's the man that knows things, okay? He knows what to do, where to go. We People like that are awesome, right? Everything in the club was of the best. Ambrose, the genius of the orchestral arrangements, was on the bandstand, playing the violin and leading his band with that sardonic expression so well known to his fans. The lives of Mayfair were an open book to our friend Ambrose. He knew everything about everyone. We all know people like this. This is good and bad, right? There's always there's always someone like this, though. But the affairs of his club were conducted with all the discretion of which the name applies. Mm -hmm. Love that. Invariably, what's the saying? Snitch snitches get stitches. We, we don't want this. We don't want to lose our reputation. Invariably, at the embassy, there was a sprinkling of society and stage. Nelson Keyes, a favorite vaudeville actor now dead, was seen to be supping there every night. Ha! A miniature little man. <laughs> I love how things are worded. He's so polite. Even, this is great. Even back then. It must have been his sense of fitness, which always made him choose small partners to sup and dance with, such as little June, who later became Lady Inverclyde. Uh, gentlemen, to those out there sh known as short kings in the modern world, if you can dance, people will glance at you. You'll get a, if you can dance, you'll get a glance, right? You can overlook your height and height racism by learning to dance and maybe even be immortalized in a book one day, okay? Just always know to dance is the main thing. At midnight, there will be an exodus of people to the Grafton Galleries, which were in Grafton Street just across the road. 
the versatile four going on from Murray's club to play. Looking back at the room, okay, so yeah, so that's the versatile, the colored group going back to play again, right? So everyone's just moving around between these clubs. It was pretty cool, right? A hot happening scene by the sound of things. Looking back at the room, I perceived now that it was uh, that it was merely a large bleak ballroom, the sole furniture being gold cane chairs and little gold tables, with perhaps a couch interspersed here and there. Leading out of the ballroom was the supper room which meant a long buffet table covered with sandwiches, chocolate, and vanilla ice cakes. There were no spirits to keep our spirits up, but they, but they were unnecessary. Wow, that's interesting. I'm, I'm just going to have some water now. To me, it was absolute heaven. We went there with our chosen partners, and we had a good band, plenty of space, and lovely airy room to dance in. And what more could anyone want if they were really keen on good dancing, as we all were in those days? Right, so isn't that interesting? So that's the thing about dancing, right? Particularly boredom dancing is a social thing. You really just need the people. That's it. You get the people, some ch- couple of plastic chairs. The vibe is going to work. It's going to work. You just need the right atmosphere with the right amount of people. Okay, so stay with me, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just see where we're at. Okay. Another place we frequented was Rector's. This was one of a slightly different caliber, Mm -hmm. not so health-giving as it was underground. But there again was a certain amount of space. There was a band of a different type, the original Dixieland band it was called. Whereas one might describe the versatile four as playing sweet music, these virtuosi of jazz hotted it up (laughs) and went to the town in a big way. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, they did. It went to a town, baby. I like that. But you had to go underground for this, all right? It could not be seen from the street. Two other favorite places were the Roof Garden at the Criterion and the Metropole in Northumberland Avenue. At the latter, the attraction was the Midnight Foils, a presentation of exhibition dancers and well-known artists of vaudeville who entertained the smart world while it supped. I feel like I need to go supping. Does anyone else want to sup? Supping sounds amazing. All right. This was the forerunner to the floor shows, which were so popular prior to 1939. During this period, there were three dancers in vogue, the waltz, the foxtrot, and the one step. I don't know what the one step is. We've lost the one step. Can anyone do the one step out there? For a short time, the foxtrot evolved by itself, as it were. When a waltz was played, everyone looked so dreamy-eyed and said, ah, the waltz but went on the floor and did exactly what they did in the foxtrot. I've had students do this. I'm like, they're not the same. Ah, they're not the same. Don't dance them the same. The one step was more uniform. As to the music of that, the only thing that one could do was to walk, which we did with all the energy and enthusiasm. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings the book Dancing Through Life with Josephine Bradley, chapter number four, to a close. Join me for the next episode where we go into chapter five, which is called The Blind Officers.